You're listening to the First Corinthians When Immaturity Meets Worldliness series preached by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We had a chance last week to be away, so thankful for that. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but so glad to be able to go away and to know that the church is in good hands. Sunday morning, Brother Dan, Sunday evening, Brother Ian. Someone said, yeah, an, an, an older Scotsman preached on Sunday. And I thought, there's only one older Scotsman that I know, all right? And so I appreciate that, the fact that, it, that no matter who's here, the Word of God is proclaimed. I'm a little nervous this morning because when you're used to, to preaching and teaching every week, if you miss a week, things sort of build up within you. And so you have all these things that you want to say. And so I'm just warning you now as we get into the word, we're going to be flying through this. So put your seatbelt on, buckle up, and uh, here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. And look with me, if you would, at verse number 1. Moreover, now I hope that we have been... uh, reading the Word of God properly, that we've been proclaiming the Word of God properly, that we know that when you see the word moreover, or for, or therefore, or or any of those words, that you understand that that portion of Scripture did not just fall from the sky, it has a context. And so the context is, Paul says, moreover, he's referring back to chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, which he just finished. And if you recall from two weeks ago, at the end of chapter 9, well, let's just read it together. We're right there. Look at verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain an Corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. So fight I not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And and just to remind you, this is not a new idea that we're going to discuss this morning. Paul is reminding us that just like an Olympic athlete, who runs to win. They, they, they participate in the game to win a medal, to win honor, to win glory. And, and, and just as that athlete desires to win the race, um, they're willing to discipline their lives. They're willing to say no because they want this prize. And if you recall from two weeks ago, the prize was a, a wreath, a crown of, of leaves that by the time they received it, it was already starting to wilt. Paul says, just like that athlete who who runs for this crown and this prize and understands that they could be disqualified, he said, I'm running a race. You are running a race. And Paul says, I therefore live with purpose. With purpose. Paul says, as believers, we are in a race. It's the race of our life, our Christian life. And he says, there is a purpose. Jump back to verse number 23 of chapter 9. He's going to tell us the purpose. He says, and this I do for the gospel's sake. We've been talking about liberties. We've been talking about freedom starting in chapter 8, 9, and now 10. And what Paul is saying is this. My Christian life is more than just liberties. It's more than just freedom. These are vehicles that I am using for the glory of the gospel. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned that there tends to be this gap for believers between worship on Sunday and life on Monday. That we come here and we, we sort of get an idea of what this is about and we praise and we worship and then we leave this place and act as if this never existed. Several weeks ago, he's preaching from chapter 9, If you recall the the illustration, Paul says, I have become all things for all men that I might save some. Do you remember the challenge a couple weeks ago? He said, listen, 
If Paul was willing to get outside of his comfort zone to share the gospel, we should be willing to do the same. And then I ask you to do something. I ask you to think of three people in your heart and mind that you know, that you love, that you care for, or maybe you don't even care for, but that they need the gospel. So write them down. And then I ask you to pray for them. And then I ask you, when given opportunity, if you could step outside of your comfort zone and share your faith. Anybody remember that? Okay. How many remember it, but you don't want to raise your hand? Because Okay, thank you. Now listen, I don't know if you did that or not. And, I'm, and I do know for some people, they actually gave a testimony the other day, and they, they did not. But we all fall, we all fail, we stumble, we get back up. But um, when I preach to you, I, I want you to know the study that's involved It has to go through me first, right? And when I'm here and I'm speaking, it's not just you need to do this. This is for me. And when I was studying for that text and when I laid that challenge out, right away in my heart and mind and Kim's, there were several people that just came to our minds. And we sort of, we already knew who they were going to be. And so we prayed and said, Lord, open up these doors. We prayed for those folks. And my wife has a woman that she does some business with and an older lady that she has a friendship with and she was talking with her the other day before we went away, and, and as they were talking, Kim felt this idea, like, hey, I should probably, this is the person I was thinking about. This is who I prayed for. I should, I should broach the topic. I don't know how to do it, but I, I need to do this. And while they were talking, the woman said, Kim, what do you think about what's going on in this world today? Okay. It's almost like, what must I do to be saved? And so they began to talk, and, they, and Kim had a chance to share her faith with her. It was a wonderful thing. And then we went away to Cleveland, you know, God's country. Um, and thank you. I have, I have one amen, and, and she's probably never been there before. Have you been there before, Melissa? Okay, yeah. Um, have you been downtown Cleveland? Okay, good. All right. And so we went there to see family, and um, my wife's grandmother's there. She's 94 years old, and that was the name that came to my mind. And uh, an opportunity on Saturday morning just to sit down with her and to, to go through the gospel. I don't know what it is about family members, but it's difficult. It is. And then we somehow think that, well, I'll just wait until they're at the end, and then I'll talk to them. But it was like, no, this is the time. And so I talked with her, and I witnessed with her, and, 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 and had a great time with her. And then we went to a family gathering with my family, and that's different. It's just different. It's like, this is Kim's family. This is my family. All right? And, uh, and it was good. We had a great time. And my uncle was there, and, and he's... he's a recovering alcoholic, he struggled with depression. I'm sitting across from him, um, and he says to me, you know, this comment about, man, I've really gone through some struggles. And I talked to my uncle, and, and it just opened up. Listen to me. Um, I wasn't on the clock. Because the pastor is supposed to do those things, right? That's your job. But it, I wasn't on the clock. You, you see, the gospel has to be a natural outflow of our lives. And listen, I know we fail. A guy was talking yesterday and said, I I knew the opportunity was there, and I didn't do it. And when he said those words, I thought back in my own heart and mind of thousands of times when I was confronted with an opportunity to share, and I didn't. And we sort of mock Peter about, oh, Peter, how could you deny the Lord? And so often we're given opportunities. But listen to me. Paul's desire and Paul's purpose, it was clear. It was for the glory of God, for his kingdom, for the gospel. And that should be an outflow of our life, not just on Sunday, but on Monday. Can I tell you something? When we really get the the idea of what the gospel is and and the power of the gospel, um, it changes everything. It's not just full-time Christian service. Can I tell you something? Even in the mundane things that we do, there's an opportunity to live a life of purpose. Let's take one area, for instance, work. How many folks this morning, you love, you love, you love, you love your job? Can I see your hands? Good. This was a really good response. Dan? Okay, good. (laughs) Tara had to hit him and nudge him. Love my job. Now, how many folks would be honest this morning and say, Pastor, you know what? I hate my job. All right. It's fair enough. Get it. Understand it. It's hard. And maybe your job is hard work. Maybe it's management's crazy. Maybe there's nutty people there who are drama kings and queens, right? I get it. But now listen to me. 
when we understand our purpose in light of the gospel, work becomes sanctified. It's an opportunity, of course, to, to get wealth. Uh, it's an opportunity to manage it wisely, which we must do. It's an opportunity to flourish. But not only that, do you understand something? At the places that we work, where we spend most of our time, it's an opportunity for all of us to show the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. And I'm not saying go to work, take your big Bible, throw it down, and don't do any work all day. That's a bad testimony. And you should be fired for that. You're not getting paid for that. But you should go to work, and you should be honest. You should work hard. You should try not to complain. You should try to remember that those people there are lost without Christ. And none of us are perfect, but there ought to be something in our lives, even in our places of work, that we hate. That says, Christ has changed me. And so, it's an amazing thing that when we get this purpose and focus of the gospel, everything in life changes. Even the trials I go through, the difficulties, the loss of the past, the heartache, the depression. What happens when I see my purpose and my view, I understand that this God that I serve and love is working through all of that. And when my goal and purpose is for his glory and his kingdom and for the sake of the gospel, it all makes sense to me that he will use even those bad things in my life for purpose. I say this often, and, and I hope you understand what I'm saying. I, I come from a broken home, broken family, and, and really broken, broken. My kids, they, they don't understand what a fight is, right? They think a fight is, Tim, that is not a fight, okay? I'm talking throwing, breaking, cursing. I, I mean, that's fighting, right? Brokenness. And, and, and hard, difficult times. My mom raised three boys on her own. But can I tell you something today? As I view God and his purposes and his plans, if I could change those things in my life, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. It's maybe the man I am today. It's giving me an opportunity to sit across from people who have struggled in those same areas, and I'm not oblivious to the hurt and the pain and the problems. I can relate and can say that the comfort that God gave me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, is the same comfort that God will give you. And so Paul, it's clear for him, and I want it to be clear for us, I'm really concerned this morning that too many of us, we come here, and this is the extent of it. And Paul says, stop it. Stop rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. That's stupid. Get a purpose. Get a passion. It's Christ. It's his kingdom. It's his gospel. And when I get that, my liberties, my freedom, and everything else, it changes. That's what Paul is saying here. And so now, in light of that, and in light of what he's been talking about here, he comes to chapter 10. And uh, chapter 10 is interesting because Paul is continuing this challenge about these believers who are so concerned about their freedom and their liberty and what they wanted to do. And Paul says, wait a minute. That's not what this life is about. That's not what Christian freedom entails. But he was challenging again the Corinthian believers for eating meals in pagan temples. And they had this idea that, well, well, we have knowledge, and so what we do doesn't matter, and we know the truth. It was a terrible attitude. And Paul said, listen. He gives this example in chapter 9 and says, I'm afraid that in my Christian life I could preach this gospel. As I preach this gospel to others and they, they respond to it, that it doesn't touch my heart. And I run this race and it's empty. And so Paul is being honest and being transparent and saying, listen, I run with certainty. I fight as one that doesn't beat the air. I have a purpose because I don't want to just be set aside. I want to finish my race. And the Corinthians are like, Paul, that might be you, but not us. We have knowledge. We have blessings. Paul, we are in Christian community. We have enjoyed communion together. We have enjoyed baptism together. We know, Paul, and you might fall and you might fail, but not us. We got it all together. And that's our attitude. Sound familiar? How many times in our lives? We think we got it all together. 
And that sin or that problem or that failure would never happen to us. I can't believe they did that. I would never do that. And Paul says, you better be careful. Chapter 10, verse 1 now. In light of the Corinthian believers, in light of this attitude, in light of what he's still talking about, they had this idea that spiritual blessings that they experienced would somehow keep them immune from falling and failing. Therefore, they could live their life any way they want to. They could enjoy life and do whatever they wanted to do. They had freedom, and they were going to enjoy it. And what Paul is going to do now in chapter 10, the beginning of this, is to look at biblical history and show them some comparisons between them and the children of Israel and drive home a powerful point. Verse number 1, chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, brothers and sisters, that's what he means there. I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And uh, let me just stop here, because as we're going to go through this, for the next ten verses, he is going to talk to these people about their attitude about how great they are, how they could never fall, they could never fail, they've received all these blessings, they're okay, and now he's going to go back and talk about Old Testament history to make a point. And for the next 10 verses or so, that's what he's doing. He's going to talk about Israel and the nation. Now, I want you to, to, to be aware of something. Be aware of something right now. Um, this church in Corinth was not predominantly a Jewish church. There were Jewish believers there. They were predominantly Gentiles. And yet I want you to notice that Paul will take the Old Testament and use the Old Testament, the significance of the Old Testament, to teach them some things. This church, although they were Gentiles, were aware of the Old Testament. They used the Old Testament. It was significant to their walk in Christian life. And Paul calls on the Old Testament to talk to them. Now listen to me. I say that to say this. We as believers cannot de-emphasize, we cannot ignore or neglect the Old Testament. It's not the Jewish book. And and some of us, I I know, you you have this idea that, Pastor, I can believe the New Testament, but I have real trouble with that Old Testament. Man, Adam and Eve, serpent in the wilderness, Tower of Babel, I mean the plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea. I mean, I believe in Jesus, but these things are just too much for me. Can I say something to you? Because these are conversations that lots of believers are having. I've had these conversations with folks. If you're a believer in Christ, you believe that a man walked this planet and said, no man can take my life. I'm going to lay it down. And when I do, I'm getting up three days later. And he did. Can I tell you something? That is the greatest miracle of all time. And if you can believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ, certainly you can believe what he says and what the apostles say about the Old Testament. You have already believed the greatest miracle that ever happened, the miracle that secures our salvation. We don't have two books. That's the Old Testament. That's the New Testament. We don't have two gods. We have one story, and it's the greatest story. It's the story of redemption. And it's ours. And so Paul says, listen, Gentile believers, don't ignore the Old Testament. There's a purpose. There's a plan. It's the whole story. That was just extra. Okay. He says, all fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. And, And again, I want you to notice there's an important word there. It's all. You're going to find it for the next couple of verses. All, 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 all. And here's what he's doing. He wants them to know that when he's talking about the children of Israel now, it's not just a few of them. It's not just the weak ones. It's not just those who were nominal. He puts them all together and he says, all of them were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, to save some time and some energy this morning, I want to show you what he's talking about quickly by going back to the Old Testament. So, if you were good at Bible sword drills, you can do this. You can put your Bibles up and you can find it quickly. But if not, let me just put it on the screen here, what he's talking about. Exodus 13, 21. 
Here's what the Bible says. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them, to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. And you know what this is? This is the deliverance from Egypt, right? It's the Old Testament. We, we've been there. We've, we've heard the story. And then Exodus 14, 21. Oh, I'm sorry. It should have been 13 first. 13 on their day? Thank you. Oh, it's the same thing. Okay, you get the idea. The same thing, all right? That's good. Good job, Dave. My bad, all right? Good job. Um, they passed through the sea, were under the cloud. And this includes the idea of God's protection, his saving presence, his faithfulness, his mercy, his glory, all right? Verse number two. And were all, again, all of them, baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay? And, and so what he's saying here is, listen, I want you to know something. You who think that you're above falling or failing, I want you to know something. All of the children of Israel received deliverance by God, and all of them, it says, were baptized into Moses. And you think, well, that's strange. What does that mean? But baptized means to be identified with. That whole congregation was identified with Moses who delivered them as they went out of Egypt. And, and we do the same thing today in baptism. Baptism does not save us. Baptism doesn't wash away our sin. Baptism identifies us with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this group of people in Israel now were identified as God's special people with Moses. It was a type of baptism, Paul says. Okay? Verse number 3 and 4. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. And uh, the references for this are Exodus chapter 16, verse 15. When the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. And this is the wandering wilderness. You know how this goes. The bread comes down. They eat it for 40 years. The next text about the spiritual drink, Exodus 17, verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. And the people could drink, and Moses did those things. Okay? And so, so Paul says, listen, I'm, I'm telling you the history of Israel because just as you have been delivered, just as you've experienced baptism, just as you've experienced the Lord's Supper, these blessed people of God have experienced the same type of thing. They were privileged in an unusual sense. Visually, they saw these things. And there's a likeness here, but, but I want you to know, they had great blessings. They were blessed. Look at verse 4 now. He talks about that spiritual, that, that divinely given drink. And he says something very strange. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that spiritual rock that followed them. It's weird. I don't know what you think of when you read that verse, but I think about walking and a rock following behind me. That's what it sounds like to me. Okay? And in Jewish um, rabbinic kind of teaching, there was this idea that as the children of Israel went through the promised land, before they went to the promised land in the wilderness, that they had Marion's well. And Marion's well was a well shaped like a rock that was movable. And so that's how they explain. That's what they're talking about here. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. I think there's more happening here. This idea of this, this rock was divinely given. And the point is that God continually provided for his people through, elder, through the wilderness. It's interesting, in that first reference in, in Exodus, it's the first time we see of Moses and the rock. It's the beginning of their wandering. And the next one we see is the second time, right before they go in the promised land, where he hits the rock twice. Remember that story? But there's no other reference to that. And so what I think is happening is God is saying, hey, just like I've provided manna for my people through those years, I've provided water for them as well. And Paul is more interested in the source of that water. That spiritual rock which followed them. Now, let me just make some conclusions here on this text because it's important. Deuteronomy chapter 32, Paul's using the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy 32, he, he makes reference to this rock over and over again. Verse 3 says, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, and that's Yahweh, capital L, capital O, R, D. Ascribe greatness unto our God. Verse 4. He is the rock. He's the rock. God's the rock. Jump down to verse number 15 of that text. And here's what it says at the end of that text. 
he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Jump down to verse number 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Verses 30 and 31 saying the same thing. The rock that sold them, and the Lord has shut them up. And so Paul says these people had this rock, this divine source of water, and this rock is associated with the God of heaven, Yahweh. You say, Pastor, why is that important? It's important because the very next statement he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look again at verse number 4. And that rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. This is strange. It's one of those things that you can spend a lot of time with. What he's talking about, what is he talking about? That Christ was that rock that followed them. And I want you to know something. If you were to ask the children of Israel who are wandering through the wilderness, is this Christ? They'd have no idea what you're talking about. But I want you to know what Paul does. He goes back and says this. All of the saving acts in the Old and New Testament, there's one person behind all of it. It's Jesus Christ. It's Christ. He is Yahweh. He is the expressed image of the glory of God. And that's why, my friend, listen to me. When we gather together, it's all about Christ. He must be exalted. He must be elevated. It's all about him. And we find this over and over again in the Old and New Testament. It is about Jesus Christ. And, and for most of us, the problem with our life is we never see the beauty of who he is. He is the rock. He is the one who's completely satisfied. He is our Savior. He is altogether beautiful. We must see him for who he is. And Paul says that rock is Christ. Now, verse number 5. 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 5. So he's just said all of these people have experienced, children of Israel, great blessings. I mean, they've seen the water parted. They've seen the cloud. They've seen the fire. They've been fed manna. They've been given water. And then he says... All of them experienced it, but in verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. Can I say something to you? That is, the, that is a major understatement. Remember the wandering in the wilderness? How many people over the age of 20 survived after 40 years? Two. Joshua and Caleb. And so Paul says, listen to me. You, you're so arrogant about what you've experienced. Here was a whole assembly, almost 2 million people who were led out of Egypt, and those 20 and over who saw all these things, who drank the water, who saw the cloud, who experienced deliverance. It says, God was not well pleased with many of them because of their disobedience, because of their unbelief. And they were overthrown in the wilderness and that word overthrown is very graphic. It, it has the idea of slaying, like bodies strewn all over the place. And he does it on purpose. You get the, the effect that says, hey, you talk about being blessed. These people were blessed. And after 40 years, their bodies and their carcasses laid all over the wilderness. Verse number six. Now, these things were our examples. Our examples. These privileged people had failed to obey. And there's a warning here. Look at verse number 7 now. Verse 7 says, Neither be ye idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And now he's going to go through this whole list. And again, you've got to get what he's doing. He's again using the children of Israel as an example, and he specifically points out sins of these people that the Corinthians are doing. Verse number 7 says, idolatry. And he gives the example of the golden calf. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, verse number 8, he says, don't commit fornication, as they did. We have the story of Moab in Numbers chapter 25. And Paul has been dealing with these Corinthians in chapters 5, 6, and 7 about fornication. Verse number 9, look at this one. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. It's interesting. He says tempt Christ again. Christ in the Old Testament. They were going to pagan temples. And then verse number 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. And this grumbling and complaining. Can I say something to you? We live in a world of complainers. This is just on a side note here. We have a society that's never happy. It's too hot, too cold, 
too rainy, farmers. It's too dry, right? This guy in front of me is driving me crazy. He's in the fast lane going slow. The guy at Tim Hortons has ordered too many things. The guy at Starbucks has all these special things to add in their coffee. And we go crazy. We are always murmuring and complaining. All of us do it. The children of Israel did it. They were destroyed. Listen to what um, Alan Johnson says about this grumbling in the wilderness. He says, grumbling is a deliberate challenge to God's authority and purposes for his people. So, so when the weather is warm or the weather is cold or when it's raining or the guy in front of me is slowing me down or that person in line is irritating, when I grumble, I am challenging God's authority in my life on what he has allowed for me. Apparently, I need some of these lessons. The children of Israel grumbled. He, he goes on to say this. They were not content with their new freedom from slavery, the provision of the manna, and God's guidance and protection. They exchanged their blessed, redeemed condition for self-pity and ingratitude. They became victims instead of victors. They grumbled. Listen to me. Quit being a victim. This is just extra. You never get on in life if you're the victim. But they, they grumbled. And these people in Corinth were grumbling as well. Grumbling as well. Look at verse number 12. Now, he brings this point to a, a conclusion. He says, Wherefore, with everything I just told you, that the children of Israel went through the wilderness, they were blessed, they had all these blessings by God in their lives. God was not well pleased, they sinned, they were judged. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. The Corinthians assumed that because of their knowledge, their blessings, their liberties, their freedoms, that they were immune to the danger of falling. And Paul's point is, listen to me, if the children of Israel can fail, then the people in Corinth could fail. And if the people in Corinth can fail, can I tell you something this morning? The people of Chatham-Kent can fail as well. And that's his point. Take heed when you think you stand. Christian, this morning, listen to me. We prayed this morning about the blessings of God, and we enjoy them. But sometimes we think that we're immune. We're immune from failure. We're immune from sinful behavior. We're immune from falling because of these things. My friend, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. We are not immune at all, at all. There are some teenagers in this room this morning that you believe that you're immune. You don't care what you've heard from the Word of God. You don't care what your parents say. You don't care the examples that you've seen in life that tells you this route and this way will end in destruction, and you think, it would never happen to me. And Paul says, hey, if it happened to Israel, if it's happening in Corinth, it can happen to you. Don't Fail. Don't think that you're immune from these things. We have couples today who are married who believe that they're immune from ruining their marriages. Because they go to church. And they show up. Which, by the way, um, the statistics over the years that said that, that there's no difference between divorced people outside the church and inside the church is wrong. There is a difference. Couples who pray together and attend service together and worship together have a greater chance of being together for life than any others. Just that you know. But just because you sit in this church, you want to dabble in flirtatious relationships, and you think you're okay, you're a fool. Take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. There are believers today that you think that you can live your life any way you want to. It doesn't matter. You have freedom, you have grace, you have liberty, and so you will do whatever you want to do, and you think there's not ramifications for that. My friend, there are. And Paul's point is this. If these Israelites were so blessed to see the glory of God, and yet all but two in that generation failed, you're insane to think that you won't or you can't. Insane. We're not immune. We tend to be great starters. We start really strong. We're poor finishers. 
Can I tell you something? I'm living this Christian life. I'm not living it to be cast to the side, to be cast away, to fail. I want to win. The stuff that I do, I want to win. We were playing soccer a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was on a team that was disadvantaged. There was only like three of us, and we were playing a team that had four guys. I won't say who the players were, but we were playing, and we were getting killed. I mean, I think it was like four to nothing. I don't remember. Were you there, Dan? Okay. It was, it was, it was five to nothing, and we were, getting, we were getting killed. And so it's starting to get dark out, and we're not quitting. I, I don't know who's on my team. Who's on my team? Do you remember? Andy and, and Johnny quit on us. And, who, and, and then who was the last one? Jared. It was Jared's. And we didn't quit. It's getting dark. And I said, listen, we're going to quit in a minute. But the next one to score wins. Yes. And guess who scored? We did. All right? <laughs> it was fantastic. It was glorious. And listen, I play to win. I play to win. Listen, this Christian life's important. It's more than a game. It's more than a career. It's more than some nest egg that I have that I can retire on. It's what it's all about. We are marching toward eternity. And I don't know about you, but, but I want to believe that when this is all said and done, I'll have something to show for all eternity that I did something for my Savior. That I could maybe possibly hear, well done, a good and faithful servant. Okay, so you say, okay, I'm with you. I understand that. I, I, I agree. But then what's the answer? If there is a chance of failure, and there is, so what's the hope that we don't fail? And I'm glad you asked. Because we already talked about it in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Remember what Paul said? Paul said, I am living this life with purpose. If you want to complete this race, you better understand your purpose. The purpose is the glory of God and his gospel. And again, quit rearranging furniture on the Titanic and I'm into this and I'm into that and this is the newest thing and this is the latest thing and I'm going to try this. Listen, understand what your purpose is. Your purpose is the glory of God and his gospel and his kingdom. And when that's my focus, everything changes. I set aside things that don't matter. I don't get caught up in this nonsense. I don't have time for that. I have purpose. And then he says... I live with discipline. I say no. We don't like to hear people tell us no. It starts from an early age, like one, two. But we don't like to tell ourselves no. We like to believe that we can just do whatever we want to do without saying no. Christian brother or sister, listen to me. You want to run this race? You want to be different from the majority that ends up crashed on the rocks? You better have a purpose, and you better be willing to say to your flesh, no. It's called to mortify, to kill, to say, I am not going there, I'm not doing that. Even if it's okay to do, it's not what's best for me. Paul's warning rings true, not just for the Corinthians but for us today. There's a race to run. There's a crown to be won. And it does matter. And your life matters. Where God has placed you matters. Find out what your purpose is. It, it's, it's the gospel. And discipline yourself. Say no to the flesh. Say yes to God. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. Lest he fall. Let's have a word of prayer.